Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the High Impact Broadcasting Network, where we literally beg you to check everything out, do your own due diligence, question everything, and then question it again so that you can land on the firm bedrock of sound reason and unassailable logic. And don't even think for a second that you're going to turn your mind off on this program because my guest and I plan on climbing inside the control panel of your mind and pushing as many buttons as we can push to see if we can free your minds of every last vestige, every last bit of cancerous status propaganda. So my guest today is Jared Howell. Why the heck should you care who Jared is? And why the heck should you even be listening to this broadcast right now? Guys, you are going to find out because there is a malignant cancer in our society and almost everyone you know is afflicted with this dreaded disease. And my guest, like many others like him, has the cure. What's the disease? It's statism. It's the epidemic, I mean a real epidemic, that almost no one talks about. Jared is an anarcho-voluntarist. He's a writer and a hip-hop artist whose main focus is the promotion of voluntarism. That voluntarism is an ideal that all interactions, every interaction, should be consensual. And let me just stop right here and ask everybody who's listening to this broadcast. Do you think that every interaction should be consensual? And I mean every interaction. If your answer is yes, then you are against the ideology known as statism. And therefore, you are an enemy of the state. You're the enemy of so-called government and an enemy of the concept of authority itself. Jared is also the host of a weekly podcast called The Downfall on the Seeds of Liberty Podcast Network. Now, he's got a lot of other credentials, and I'm going to post those on the screen right here, as you can see, and you'll also find the links to everything Jared's involved in in the description below. So, Jared, welcome to the show. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Yeah, man. Great to have you. It's it's finally good to, to get a chance to hook up with you, because I know we've been kind of doing the message tag back and forth, and our schedules really haven't been meshing, so it's really good to finally get a get a time where we could just talk about this stuff, because it's so, so important. No, I agree. I've I've been excited to do this. I'm really glad we were able to work it out. Now, listen, I'm going to give you a definition, a definition of statism, and I'd like you to kind of expound on it. Just for the audience, statism, guys, it's this delusional belief. And I mean delusional because if you think about what statism is and what it promotes, you will have to come to the conclusion that it's delusional. It's, it's a belief in magic, a belief in wonderland, fairy tale stuff. It's the delusional belief that some people have a moral right to govern or lord over other people through force. It's actually a cultic idea that almost everyone, everybody that you know of, subscribes to. It's the most dangerous cult in history. So, Jared, if you can just expound on that, because I I really want to delve into what statism is and what we can do to resolve it. Sure, no problem. Uh, As you said, statism... It is a delusion, but it's a, it's a superstitious delusion that people uh, it gets it gets bred. I don't want to say bred into them, but it is something that people are raised with, and that they're taught from a very young age that might equals right, and that some people have for for some reason the right and the ability to initiate force and violate the bodily consent of other people without their permission with even though you know most people would be against that right and in other in other areas of their life like nobody wants their own consent violated to have something ripped out of their hands even like a like a toddler knows that people who can't even talk know that if you rip something out of a toddler's hands they what what happens they scream and they cry they have a temper tantrum because they experienced a violation of their consent so to speak so you also all of us as adults realize that in terms of like the dating market and uh, sexual relationships, we understand that initiating a sexual interaction against, you know, or initi- you know, having, putting yourself where you're forcing yourself on somebody without their permission, that's wrong. 
we all we all know that but when it comes to some things like building roads or putting out fires or providing emergency services for some reason all of that goes out the window and people only look at the end result they they don't even consider how it's funded or where it comes from now statism like you said the delusion that this is okay that theft that kidnapping that murder that all of that's okay, that it's okay to violate the consent of other people as long as somebody benefits from it. And can you think of a single crime, Brian, where somebody doesn't benefit from committing it? If they didn't expect to benefit from com committing it, then they wouldn't have committed the crime. So the fact that there's a beneficiary of a crime doesn't justify the crime. In fact, what makes the crime unjustifiable is the fact that there was a victim. It doesn't matter what the benefit is. That's why when people, you say, you know, maybe roads shouldn't be funded by stealing from people people automatically assume that you're against roads and they can't imagine any other way that roads could be paid for, which isn't entirely unlike uh, saying that slavery should be ended and people say, well, who will pick the cotton? People depend on that cotton to stay warm. You just hate people in the North. You know, that's the same idea. To, to oppose, you know, the method in which something's funded to oppose Theft is not to oppose the service that's provided with theft. Us as voluntarists or anarchists, we're not saying that there shouldn't be roads. We're not saying that there shouldn't be defense. We're not saying that there shouldn't be emergencies. But it's not that we don't want these things to be provided. It's that they should be provided voluntarily and consensually, just like you pay your Netflix bill or you pay your internet bill. You don't do those things because somebody's going to point a gun in your face if you don't. But the same really the same thing cannot be said about roads. If you drive on the roads without paying, you know, for registration, for without paying the taxes, without paying for a license, then somebody will threaten you with force. And if you don't listen to them, if you resist, they will escalate force until you're dead. Now if if that's not saying you don't want to pay for the roads, but they, what other way is there to pay for roads when you have this cartel, this group of people who force them to pay them, they use that same force to prohibit others from competing with them. So they force people into purchasing their service. With other services, like say, uh, you know, the grocery store, say if you go to Walmart to buy groceries, if you don't like the service at Walmart, you can go somewhere else and buy your groceries somewhere else. The people calling themselves government make that absolutely impossible for everything, every type of service or good that they put their hands in. And then they pretend like those services wouldn't be provided without them. When really it's competition between different people that makes things better. For example, your iPhone, the iPhones that come out get better every single year because Apple has to compete with, you know, HTC and Samsung and all these other companies that make phones. Could you imagine if the government, the government who's in charge of making roads now was the only place you could buy a, a phone from? We, we'd probably still all be using rotary phones, right? Absolutely, and there's a couple. Of, there's a couple of buzzwords you said. What would you say the opposite of statism is? Because you you said it, you alluded to it, but a lot of people are scared of it, and um, it's it's the word anarchy. Do you do you prefer? I mean, anarchy is synonymous with the word voluntarism. So what what do you prefer when you're talking about these ideas? I think that's a great question, and honestly, it depends on who I'm talking to. I agree with you that they both mean the same thing. But to, depending on who you're speaking with, they might have different uh, interpretations of those things. So if I'm speaking to somebody uh, on the left who's maybe more inclined to like social programs, uh, support social programs, welfare, those sort of things, I'd probably be more apt to call it voluntarism as where if I was talking to somebody on the right who is more free market oriented, I would actually call it something more like anarcho-capitalism, which I see capitalism as being the same thing as anarchism as well, because with capitalism, uh, private parties, are, which if you think about it, every individual is a private par party or a private, uh, private actor. Private parties are the owners of everything. So 
in that case, there is nobody forcing them to do anything with their property. And anytime they do something with their property, it's because they voluntarily chose to do so and because the people that they're interacting with also voluntarily chose to do so. So, I mean, I, I would use any of those three words, capitalist, anarchist, voluntarist, and I know anar they all have, other than voluntarist, anarchist and capitalist both have negative connotations. So if I if I sense that somebody that I'm going to be talking to is going to be apprehensive to those terms, then I might be more apt to use voluntarist regardless of where they lean politically or ideologically, if that makes sense. No, it totally makes sense, and that's why I brought the point up because uh, you can look – anybody who's listening can look in the dictionary, and there's a couple of definitions for the word anarchy, and one of them is mayhem and chaos. But when a lot of people think of anarchist, Jared, I think they think that – you know, when they think of that word anarchist, they associate it with these masked thugs tossing Molotov cocktails and rocks at cops, overturning cars and looting the streets while while things are burning in the streets behind them, you know. But anarchy, like if we're just going to define the term, anarchy simply means without rulers. Am I wrong on that or is that, is that the proper definition? No, that's the that's the etymological definition. That That's the original meaning of the word. It literally means without rulers. Um, it's not to say that there wouldn't be rules. It's just to say that those rules wouldn't be arbitrarily set and forced on everybody at gunpoint. And not only, not only would that not happen, but people wouldn't be, you know, the, the future assets of the unborn wouldn't be sold off so that some central agency can circulate fake money to people as a loan. So, Without government, there's no universalized plunder. There's no universal debt slavery. And isn't that what the national debt is? Uh, basically just a promise that somebody who's not alive yet is going to pay you back? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Since we've defined statism as this delusional belief that some people have a moral right to govern or lord over other people through force, and we've defined anarchy as just no rulers. We don't need a leader. We are our own leader. We own our own selves. We're responsible for our own actions. What, Jared, in your estimation, is the goal of anarchy? The goal of anarchy would be for everybody to follow their own passions and desires and to be able to do anything that they want to do as long as they're not hurting anybody else or hurting anybody else's property. So the, the goal of anarchy is to be free and left alone to associate with who you want to associate with. And I think you're right. A lot of people associate the word with, you know, masked hoodlums throwing molotovs in the streets. That's not what it is. Anarchy is just the naturally, spontaneously occurring order that arises when people are left to their own devices. We, we already have anarchy. If you think about it, look at the dating market. There's anarchy in the dating market. And even though bad things happen sometimes and people get raped, that doesn't mean that uh, there are cries to abolish, uh, you know, voluntary consensual relationships, right? People are still, almost everybody out there is married to who they're married for, at least in this geographical region, this little corner of the world, they're married to who they're married to because they chose it, not because they were forced into it. So in that sense, in, in, certain, in certain areas of our lives, we already have anarchy, and it's not chaos. It's just a spontaneously occurring order. It's just people interacting with each other voluntarily and consensually. I think... A lot of the, and the apprehension that people have against the type of anarchism where people are throwing Molotovs and destroying things, I think that's well-founded. And I think that those anarchists, they're not actually anarchists. They're collectivists that don't care about anybody else's private property. Do some of them have legitimate grievances against the people they call gov government? Yeah, absolutely. As we've said, government is nothing more than men and women forcing people to pay them, but their reaction to that is totally inappropriate. They're out destroying private property of people who aren't even involved in government, uh, blocking and destroying cars, businesses, looting, that sort of thing. That's not anarchy. That's 
that's just that's a, that's a more intense form of government. That's all government is is having a moral exception to be able to get away with the initiation of force and destruction of other people's bodies and property. That's government. So these people that call themselves anarchists that are out doing those things, they're just trying to replace the current government with themselves. So people have a false sense of what anarchy is. Anarchy is simply leaving people alone to associate with who they want to associate with. That's it. That's all it is. Guys, also remember, anarchy has another goal. It's a stateless society. And why do we want a stateless society? Because think about this. If everybody's honest with themselves, the state, that's the government or authorities, they're built on the unwelcomed aggression, unwelcomed aggression of a self-appointed ruling class. They've appointed their, themselves. Where do they get this authority? I mean, it's a magical thing that they just want us to believe that they have. And they have this authority over those they intend to subjugate. If you have a ruling class, you also have subjects. And this ruling class creates commands, and they promote these commands as laws. And they treat all who don't submit to these laws, these commands, as criminals. If you break their law, I don't care if it's a small town ordinance or whatever it is, if you break one of their laws, you are, in their eyes, a criminal. And this initiation of force originates from those who call themselves authorities. These authorities think it's okay to steal people's money and to add insult to injury, they use some of that money to hire these heavily armed enforcers to make sure you obey the laws that they make. Now, if this isn't just completely sadistic and delusional, I don't know what is, and I don't know why anybody would continue to subscribe to it when they find out what true anarchy or voluntarism truly is. One of the hardest habits to break is to talk about the state as though it's some sort of physical edifice or entity that you can touch and interact with. It's, it's not. If you ask somebody to show you the state... They'll point at the ground, which is land, or they'll point at a building, or you know, and say, you know, a jail. That's the state. No, that's a that's a building. That's brick and mortar. They'll point at cops, which are people. So these people might associate with each other. They might get together with each other, and they might force people, everybody living, you know, on a certain geographical landmass, to pay them. But that doesn't prove that the state exists. It just proves that certain people will force you to pay them. And if I were to do that, Brian, if I were to force you to pay me, you would probably consider me a criminal, right? Absolutely. A costume and a badge, and I call myself government, and I point at the Constitution as my source of authority, it somehow makes it okay? That's really another very important point because uh, what if – okay, so let's say you had a uniform badge and a gun and you had this thing in your pocket called the Constitution. Does that mean that any individual on this land could just write up some fancy words on a fancy sheet of paper and get all their friends, all their buddies to put signatures on them and say, look, now I have the authority to rob you? Right, or even worse than that, if – if 20 people got together and wrote down on a piece of paper that they could force anybody they wanted to have sex with them, would that be okay? Would that legitimize gang rape? Okay, no, obviously not. That's horrendous. So if a bunch of people got together and did the same thing regarding, regarding taking people's property, if they got together and said, we have the ability to power, we have the ability and power to lay and collect taxes, we have the ability to put our hands in every bit of commerce that happens how would that be any different how would it be how would they be able to give themselves the power that no individual has and that's the root of statism is it's 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 collectivism it's this delusion that groups of people can obtain consent from individuals without the individual actually giving them consent if you have to force somebody to consent, that means it's not consensual. And you say, well, I don't like this, Brian. I don't like that these people are forcing me to pay them. Well, you should move. That's the, you should go to Somalia, a response you often get. But hey, wouldn't, be t wouldn't telling me to move, wouldn't telling me to go to Somali, Somalia just prove that it's not consensual. And I think what the problem is is that a lot of people view government the way they view, I think, an abusive relationship with the parents. You know, my house, my rules. If you don't like it, then I'm going to hit you, essentially. But what they don't feel, what they fail to realize is that government 
it's not everybody's parents. It's they don't own a house. The whole the land on which all the houses exist is not a house. People maintain their own property. To 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 force parental relationships onto people is it's sick. It really is. And to force people to pay for the cost of their own enslavement and to sign their kids up for it, force them, force them to force their kids into it. It's it's sociopathic. So no, as I said earlier, I'm not against the services provided by the people called government, like you know, schools. Those are cool. Uh, uh, sewers, water, firefighters, even defense. But the way it's done now, where there's no competition, where there's only an incentive to create more violence and more destruction and more dependence on these people, that's not helping anybody. That's making us all worse off because it's all funded by theft. And when we talk about like profits and an increase in value, profits simply when you psychologically benefit from some something. When you have when you when you're in a better state than you were before. So when the government steals something from somebody and returns a little bit back in the form of a road or something, they're not better they're not better off than they were before. They're still damaged. They're never made whole again. So it's a negative sum game. As where when people voluntarily exchange with each other, it's because both parties expect a benefit from the exchange, which means everybody's better off. It's a positive sum game. So how could a negative sum game ever make ev how could it make everyone more well off than a positive sum game? I would think that basic math and logic would indicate that it couldn't. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I would totally agree. And I would I would just say this to everybody who's listening right now, because I know what some of you guys are thinking is, how dare you guys talk about the Constitution of the United States? The, the Constitution is what is protecting our individual liberties. And guys, I totally get that. I understand. But like I said at the beginning of this um, at the beginning of this broadcast, I want to I want to jump into the control panel of your mind, and I do want to start pushing buttons, and I want to urge you guys to start asking questions because we live in a geographical location known as the United States of America. The people here are proud of their country, and they hail as the supreme law of the land a couple of documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, which were written 240 years ago. But that 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 uh, document says that it's okay for a group of people known as Congress to lay and collect taxes. In other words, there's this body of a ruling class that has been okayed by this written document to steal part of your laboring energies. You cannot for a second sit there and say, well, that's okay, because th taxation or theft by any other name is still theft. I don't care if you call it taxation or think up of a, 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 the prettiest word you can possibly think of, but taking something from somebody without their consent is stealing. I don't care who you are or what document uh, is behind you. Don't get offended at that. Just think about this logically and reasonably. And so I would ask you, uh, let me just put a question to you, Jared. How, if somebody, let's see, how could you put this? How does the Constitution benefit the individual, or does it? That's a great question. I, before I fully answer it, I, I'll say that I can understand why people uh, want to believe in the Constitution. There's some, there's, there are some good things in there, especially in the, in the amendments like freedom of speech, which is essentially the freedom to use your own body and your own vocal cords, or uh, the, the right to not be forced to testify against yourself, which is really the same as just not being forced into slavery, right? Because if somebody forces you to do something without your consent, then that basically implies that they own you. So I, uh, there's a lot of things that uphold like these basic human rights to not have force initiate. You know, they, they don't uphold it actually in the Constitution. There's a lot of content in the Constitution that speaks to those things that we all intuitively get our rights. But you're right, Brian. Article 1, Section 8, not only does it they give themselves the power to steal from people, they give themselves the power to interfere and they call it regulate the exchanges of people who aren't them, of anyone who isn't them. If the mafia did that in New York, we would recognize that it's a protection racket. But when the government does it, we believe it's okay. No, I, I don't. To answer your question fully, 
I don't think it does benefit people to say that the Constitution applies to them. I don't think that there is a benefit to it. Even the, even the Constitution itself, or the people who wrote it, said that the rights contained within don't come from the Constitution, and it's not the Constitution that protects people. The, the Constitution is a piece of parchment or paper. For, for, in order to be protected, it relies on people to act on that. So the people who act on that, it's, it's been, even in Supreme Court, they claim that they don't have an obligation to protect individual citizens, which means that the Constitution doesn't protect you at all. It just brings you, it brings you under the jurisdiction of these sociopaths, at least in words. It, they use it to say that you consent. The, the Constitution says that it exists by consent of the governed. But how could there be consent if you try to withdraw your consent and force is initiated against you? Isn't one of the prerequisites of the consent the ability to withdraw consent without some sort of consequence like that? It is, right? And in, for, like I said before, telling somebody to move doesn't prove that it's consensual. It proves that it's non-consensual. Do you agree? Yeah, and, and this – and that's – yes, absolutely, and we need to erode the delusion that people are under because I – guys, I totally understand. I'm a human being. I live in the United States. I love this country. I love the people actually of this country, and if you think about – just think about a routine traffic stop, the interaction between you and this cop. He he pulls up behind you with this special car with these special lights, and you pull over because that's just kind of what we do in society. And he walks up to you, and he's wearing special clothing, and he's got this utility belt with this gun, and he's got a badge, and he comes at you with, quote, the authority of the state. And he tells you, okay, I need your license and registration, and where are you going, and where have you come from? Asking all these questions. Now, pause that scene for a second and let's say I come behind you with my special car and I have a different kind of uniform and you look at me and you don't recognize the uniform you don't recognize my badge you don't you don't recognize the authority with which I say I'm coming at you and I ask you for your registration and your insurance what are you going to do you're going to look at me like a, a horse standing in a new gate wondering who the heck do you think you are to to violate my my life right now who who are you to even take any of my time to pull me over on the side of the road that is exactly the way we should look at anybody even if you recognize the uniform even if you recognize their words that they come at you with the authority of the state you are an individual and this person that walked out of their car is an individual and you've got to get yourself out of this collectivist status mentality that says oh these things are okay because that's just the way we do things if every one of us starts just standing up not for our country's rights but for individual rights we're all individuals you own yourself and nobody has a right to initiate force or coerce you in any way so if you if we just start thinking about this thing from logical terms and just erode this idea this cultic idea that the state has this magical authority that we must submit to we're gonna have a better society things things are gonna be better who knows you know right now for a hundred years we've been driving in in uh, internal combustion but with, with internal combustion engines on these paved roads who knows we could be flying right now if it wasn't for government intervention there was this uh video i don't know if you ever have you ever seen who killed the electric car jared i yeah i did actually i, I saw that about 10 years ago yeah, yeah, it's it's an amazing video that shows you how government restricts innovation, and they they had this electric car. GM made this electric car that, on one charge, went 300 miles. They never sold the car, but they did lease it out, and all the leaseholders were so pleased with this car. It saved them so much money. It cut down on emissions. The government steps in with GM, and they bury these cars. I think it was in the Mojave Desert or wherever. They just take took every one of these cars. There's only one or two left in some museum somewhere, but the innovation the creativity, the technology that we could have today if it wasn't for government. A lot of people are going, well, if it wasn't for government, where, who would build the roads? Where would we get our bridges? Who, how could we ever have any schools or clean running water? Look, guys, without government, who knows what we could have? But we do know that we don't want force initiated on us. We don't want violence. We don't want coercion. We know that in our interactions with our other other human beings around us, we don't grab them by the shirt collar and say, "Give me your money." Uh, they wouldn't be our friends for that much longer. But why are we why are we consenting to it when it's somebody who comes with the authority of the state? What I was going to say is you can't consent to it. The 
they, the Constitution says the governments exist by consent of the governed, but it's impossible to consent to it because if you withhold your consent, force is initiated against you. So that means there is no consent. There never was consent, and there never could be consent. It's not a consensual relationship. It's not the same thing as your parents' house, your parents' rules. We're all, at some point, you have to admit that we're all adults and no adult can be somebody else's parent. Yep, I totally agree. Listen, Jared, we are out of time uh, for this broadcast. I definitely want you to come back on. This was an excellent, excellent interview. Um, remember, Jared is the host of a weekly podcast called The Downfall on the Seeds of Liberty Podcast Network. He's also a rapper. He's got some, I don't know, you know, rap really isn't my thing, but I listen to four of Jared's um, uh, works. And man, guys, the words in these uh, these pieces are awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave those links in the description below. Uh, Jared, parting thoughts. Um, become a voluntarist. Become an anarchist. I know that you hear someone question the Constitution, or you hear someone question the idea of government. It seems radical, and you seem you know you, the first thing you probably think is, will other people take me seriously, or will they think I'm crazy? But Brian, you're absolutely right, man. You don't need the Constitution to prove that you have rights. You just use logic. You own your body because you have the best link to it. Nobody can experience your perceptions for you from first person perspective nobody can look through your eyes or think thoughts with your brain or eat food with your mouth which means that nobody can consent on your behalf consent is a bodily function as well keep that in mind if you if you're listening to this and you walk away with nothing else keep that in mind nobody can consent on your behalf if so if you're one of those people that thinks that they have somebody else's consent in the, in there explicitly telling you that they don't consent just think about it for a second maybe there's a better way you're going to run into a conflict if they're telling you that they don't consent and you're going to force yourself on them anyway or you're going to force the men and women who call themselves if you're going to tolerate or call for a demand that the men and women calling themselves government force themselves on those people there's probably a better way that doesn't involve conflict and there is it's called voluntarism it's called uh, consensual voluntary exchange that's that's all it is it, anarchy is nothing to be scared of jared thank you so much for your time i appreciate having you on thanks brian thanks for having me on we'll have to do this again soon guys this has been high impact radio i'll see you guys in the next show